huge thanks to our guest speakers, who we'll introduce in a minute, um, for coming as well, and to the amazing team in Electrify Canberra and ACT Wildlife. It was really generous. Um, I just wanted to quickly introduce the team. So even though David's not here, if you have questions, we're really happy to chat to you afterwards and, and take anything that you have back to David. He's also got a um, <clears throat> mobile office coming up on the 24th of November in Curtin from 9 till 11.30. So if you want some FaceTime with the boss, that's the best place to catch him. My name's Fiona, I'm David's Chief of Staff. This is my colleague, Rory. Rory looks after health, um, social goodness, services. social services, pretty much everything. Also, you've got the wonderful Link here, who I'm gonna hand over to in a second to do Acknowledgement of Country, because Link looks after all things First Nations for the office, sport, mental health, um, yeah. Lots and lots, sorry? Tech. And tech, of course. Yes, AI, right there. Tash is sitting up the back there. Tash is our community engagement manager and also looks after, if you need a visa, Tash is your girl. She is just extraordinarily talented. And Sarah, our electorate office manager, who's organised tonight. So huge big thanks to Sarah as well. So I might hand over to Link. Thank you, everyone. I'd just like to acknowledge that we're on Ngunnawal and Nambri country and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those to any First Nations people with us here tonight. Thank you. Terrific. So to kick us off, can I please ask you to warmly welcome Professor Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick, who's going to come up and take us through this terrific presentation. Sorry, uh, our scientists not only rely on graphs, but we usually rely on our slides as well to get us through. So uh, as mentioned, my name's Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick. I'm a climate scientist. I work at UNSW Canberra. Yes, UNSW is in Canberra. We're located at the um, ADVA campus um, over in Campbell. And I also work with um, two centres of excellence that research climate change and climate extremes over Australia. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk to you tonight, hopefully very briefly, um, is what, how climate and weather can influence bushfires. So the basic requirements for bushfires are fuel, oxygen and an, and an ignition source. Climate and weather don't control ignition, well, with the exception that lightning can cause ignition. But in terms of long-term changes, obviously climate and weather cannot affect that. 50% of all ignitions come from human activity, whether that's arson or humans doing silly things. And the other 50% comes from lightning strikes. So that's the, that's the component that climate change and weather cannot control. Obviously, for a fire to start, you need that ignition source. What weather and climate can control and does have an influence over is fire weather. So the risk of, of a dangerous fire day, for example. They, it also affects the movement of the fire and how fast it can travel. So generally speaking, when we have more fuel, um, we have hotter and more intense fires. And this does depend on the type of fuel that we're talking about. So we're talking about eucalypt forests, for example, or grassland fires. When we have moisture deficits, which is basically the last time since our most recent rainfall, this is really important in, us in assessing how bad or how high our fire danger risk rating can be. In terms of the combustibility of some of our fires, oil and eucalypt trees really does promote con the combustion. And when it's particularly dry, they have been known to explode as a fire front comes through and contribute even further to that really intense fire. On, going on from that, dry fuel burns more easily um, and more intensely. Um, and grass tends to catch a light much more quickly as well. Wind speed drives flames and embers as, as the fire front moves forward, which in turn helps uh, supply oxygen uh, to the fire as well. And when we talk about fire spotting, depending on the wind speed, that can happen up to 30 kilometres in front of the original fire front as well. So not only do you have that line of fire moving forward, that can be moved even further forward, dependent on what the wind, wind's doing at the time. 
What's really important as well is the change in wind direction. So it's not only the fact that the fire might be slowly progressing, but if we get a particular wind change, and what's, what really happens quite often in summer is a cold front coming through, the, the direction of the fire progresses uh, in, in a different direction from where it originally started. So it starts to progress in the direction of where the, um, the wind is um, pushing it to. And I'll show a diagram of that in a moment. On top of that, high temperatures before and during a fire can mean that the fuel dries out a lot more quickly, and this is actually what happened during black summer as well. And on top of that, low humidity conditions promotes much easier burns because there's a, a lot less um, moisture in the atmosphere and plants like eucalypts are more likely to combust. So they're in general kind of the weather components that goes into how severe or how bad fire conditions might be. Down the bottom there, I've also added the slope angle. So that's obviously not a weather or climate component. It's a geographical component. But this is really important in terms of how quickly and how fast a, um, uh, a fire might travel. Going uphill, fires travel much more quickly and it's dependent on, on the slope. So the steeper the slope, the faster it will move uphill. Um, and this is because the fire preheats the fuel as it starts to travel up that hill as well. So it doubles for every 10 degrees of slope that that hill might have. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of weather influences on fire, the top graph up there is actually showing the, fire, the general fire seasons that we see in Australia. So Canberra kind of sits right on the cusp of fires occurring in spring and summer or just in summer alone. So we're, we're a bit, our climatology of when fires usually occur is a bit different to Sydney. We're usually a little bit later on in the year. Um, but not as late as what might happen in the far south of Australia, for example, in Hobart. Now, that, this is a very general climatology, this figure. It comes from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. There is a lot of wiggle room around that, obviously, depending on what's going on in the seasonal scale. But that's just the general snapshot. Now, what that top right figure is showing is a typical weather map that we see when we have one of those dangerous cold fronts coming through. Now, normally everyone thinks, oh, thank goodness, a cold front. We've had some really hot weather. It's breaking those heat wave conditions. Yes, that is true. But with that comes that really strong gustily wind that can change the direction of the fire front. And I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but there's this low pressure system right down in, in the Southern Ocean and on top of that it's got a, um, a line with little triangles on it. That's the cold front moving forward. If you've ever looked at a weather map, you tend to see these when heat waves break during summer. And it's that southwesterly wind that will move further north, in a, sorry, south, yeah, southwesterly wind mo moving northeast that will change the direction of the fire front and this can be exceptionally dangerous as the cold front approaches. Now you can see here in the bottom left figure, that's what a fire, frank, a fire front usually looks like before that wind direction actually hits. Okay? We know the direction. It can be fairly well predicted given the conditions. Um, but once that wind change hits, that fire front is now on that long flank of the fire and it starts to move in a very different direction. And because the wind is going quite fast, it moves fast with that wind. That's where the danger is, is really apparent. And although we can predict these cold fronts quite far out in advance, we just don't necessarily have quite a good grasp on the exact impact it will have at a fire burning at that time. Next slide, please. Okay, on top of that, heat waves have um, a really important influence on fire. Um, some research that I've done and my team has done in, is investigating how hot weather uh, in the time of extreme bushfires can increase um, the, the um, dryness of, of the um, fuel, fuel at the time. So while heat waves can't necessarily start the drying process of fuel, um, it can certainly exacerbate fuel that's already beginning to dry. Now, unfortunately for us, unfortunately for basically everywhere in the world, the intensity, frequency and duration of heat waves have been increasing and they've been increasing the last 70 years. And the map on the left there is just showing those changes in heat wave um, uh, frequency over Australia since uh, 1950. So that's looking specifically at a heat wave definition and a heat wave is at least three or more days in a row where temperatures are really hot. But no matter you, how you slice or dice extreme temperatures, where you've, where, whether you're looking at a hot day or a hot week or a hot month, they're also increasing. Um, and that's what the bar chart on the right is showing. Um, and that's from, um, produced by the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. So as mentioned, heat waves, when they occur, increase the drying rate of fuel, especially fine fuel, and that's what's needed for the, fuel, for the fire to catch a light. And we, we saw this particularly during the 2019 black summer bushfires. This was particularly prevalent along the east coast of Australia. Unfortunately, trends in heat waves will continue in the future. This is very well known, and they also scale quite closely with the amount of global warming we will experience. So the hotter the globe becomes overall, the more heat waves we will see and the more intense they will be. Next slide. 
Um, so we also have seasonal influences on heat, on, sorry, heat waves, on bushfires, bushfires and heat waves. Um, I'm just going to talk about two here, because of course these are the ones that are most active at the moment. Now on our right here we have our friend El Nino. I think most of us are fairly familiar with the term El Nino. What it means in general is that warm pattern of sea surface temperatures you can see coming off uh, the west coast of South America and they propagate westwards towards Australia. Usually what happens when we have an El Nino is a band of relatively cool sea surface temperatures sitting off the coast of northeast Australia. And because of that sort of pattern, the atmosphere responds in a way that we see less rainfall off the t basically off the top of northeast Australia that obviously doesn't propagate um, south because you know, there's no rainfall to propagate south. With El Nino, we tend to expect hot and dry summers. Um, this El Nino, so this map that I'm showing up here is actually a picture of the sea surface temperatures um, from September. Um, this El Nino is a little bit different, however, because we still have quite warm sea surface temperatures off the coast of Australia, which we don't usually see during El Nino conditions. And this is why it took the Bureau of Meteorology quite a long time to call this particular El Nino. Um, however, we do expect that this will amplify, or at least start the drying process of, the, of all that fuel that we currently have. The figure down the bottom there is showing the forecast of, what, of just how big this El Nino might become over the coming months. Now, El Ninos usually peak in the middle of summer before they start to decline. And this is exactly what it has been forecast that this El Nino will do. It's looking like it will peak, peak around January at sea surface temperatures that are really quite extraordinary. It looks like it could be one of our hottest um, El Ninos on record, which is quite concerning for a number of reasons. Um, on the left here, we have another main climate driver of Australia called the Indian Ocean Dipole. Has anyone ever heard of this term before? Oh, great. Okay, cool. So I won't go into too much detail. It's basically kind of like El Nino, but in the Indian Ocean. And we're in a positive phase of that right, moment, of that right now. On top of that, it's also an extremely positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole. And it's actually looking like it will decay a lot later than what they usually do. The Indian Ocean Dipole is usually only in an active phase during winter and spring, and it usually decays quite rapidly by the end of this month. However, this one's looking like it might push on until at least December. Um, with a positive IOG, once again, we expect to see hot and dry conditions over South East Australia. Now, an important thing to remember, and it's, you know, this isn't, I'm sorry, a very good news message, the Indian Ocean Dipole and ENSO tend to um, interact and compound one another. So El Nino will bring hot and dry conditions, generally speaking, and the IOD or a positive IOD phase will amplify that. Okay, next slide. Um, on top of what can happen, so I've talked about weather, I've talked about climate variability, um, and here I'll be talking about climate change. Okay, so I'll be talking about climate change in the con mainly in the context of um, bushfires. I won't go into a whole spiel about how everything in the climate system is changing. So globally, we have warmed by roughly 1.1 degrees Celsius um, since the Industrial Revolution, and here in Australia we've warmed by not quite 1.5 degrees Celsius since 1900. So because of these temperature changes and how they interact with things like heat waves and other weather systems, we are seeing an increase in dangerous fire weather. We're seeing an increase in, I can never say this right, so bear with me, pyrocumulonimbus fire systems. Um, has anyone heard of those before? Yep, okay, we're nodding. Um, and we're also seeing a lengthening of the, um, of the fire season. Now, because we're seeing an, a lengthening in the overall fire season, we're actually seeing a reduction in the, um, in the window in which we can do safe hazard reduction burns. Okay? And we've, we've seen that this year. We see it year on year and year. It's, it's getting worse quite quickly. We're also seeing increases um, in dangerous fire weather. So this is basically fire days that have a, um, FFD, a forest fire danger rating of um, above 25 to 50. Now that's what this, sorry, the figure on the top there, the middle figure with the yellow line is showing how um, when, in, when uh, in the year um, we see FFDI days greater than 25. So that's the high fire danger rating. Now year on year there has been some variability, there always is variability, but we've seen this dramatic decrease in the last 70 years. So those, the, the very high um, fire rating days are actually starting a lot earlier. Um, even a couple of months earlier in some parts of Australia. Um, and that's, that's trend's been quite significant over the last um, 70 or so years. Now, one thing to remember with the pyrocumulonimbus storms, um, they are very dangerous for many reasons that I won't go into, but I'm happy to discuss that later on. Before, prior to Black Saturday, we had seen roughly 30 or so of these firestorms um, throughout of Australia. Now, there are caveats around that. Maybe perhaps our instrumental record and our observational records weren't that great until the last 30 or so years. 
But in black summer alone, we saw a doubling in those number of firestorms. So we've seen roughly 60, roughly speaking, in our history, 30 of which occurred during black summer. And these are the storms, or these are the conditions that we're really concerned about in the future, because it's actually looking like, although we can't model these um, events um, precisely um, in future projections, the conditions in which they occur are showing to increase under climate change. And they also scale with global warming as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've talked about weather, climate variability and climate change and how, you know, putting them together, they manifest into not such a great picture um, in terms of bushfire risk and bushfire weather um, in this coming season. However, I do want to point out that we are at a different starting point, and I do emphasise starting point, compared to the black summer. Now, the black summer was horrendous for many reasons. Climatologically speaking, uh, we were in a three-year drought, and we also have a, had a positive Indian Ocean dipole. It was dry. It was really, really, really dry, and we actually refer to it in climate circles as the tinderbox drought. It just got so bad so quickly. That dried out the fuel, things became super explosive, ignitions happened, and we just had an absolutely catastrophic summer. We are not there yet in this summer. However, I want to really underline that we shouldn't be complacent. We have had three La Niñas, a triple dip La Niña season. That's the fourth time only it's happened in the observational record. So now we have a lot of fuel to burn. Play, uh, fuel like um, grassland dries out quite quickly. So there's the high likelihood that as this summer progresses, we'll see a lot more grass fires than we normally see because that fuel is just there ready to go. In terms of forests, like eucalypt forests and scrub for forests, they will take a little longer to dry out, generally speaking. But if we do see that amplification of El Nino and IOD, and that happens quite rapidly, then we, could, we are certainly in for a very rough summer indeed. So we need to be careful there. Yes, we are at a different starting point. It's not as dry as what it was prior, at the start of the black summer. However, because of what's going to happen in terms of climate change, climate variability, and the weather systems that we expect this summer, things could happen, um, things could, could and will progress quite quickly. And we've already seen that in some parts of Australia anyway, the fires on the south coast and up in Queensland as well. Next slide, please. Um, so I've already talked about this, I feel. Um, we'll go into the last slide. <laughs> okay, so what does this mean for us? As I've just mentioned, we are at a different starting point to black summer, So, but on top of that, let's not be complacent about that. We shouldn't go, oh, thank goodness, we're not in a drought anymore. Even if, even if things don't get really bad this year, things will be primed to be worse in the following seasons to come. Okay? It's unlikely that we'll hit a La Nina, at least a triple La Nina again anytime soon. So conditions are really right for the fuel to dry out and to dry out quite quickly as well. A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. So things can dry out much more quickly than what they used to given that we've warmed by roughly 1.5 degrees Celsius over Australia. There is a lot of fuel thanks to our triple dip La Nina um, and grass fires tend to be more prevalent after La Nina's anyway because there's a lot of grass there and it burns quite quickly and dries out quite quickly. On top of this, we are in a new territory due to climate change. So heat waves are increasing, which allow the vegetation to grow out more quickly. As I just mentioned, a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. And we're also seeing so many more pyrocumulonimbus fires um, than what we used to um, because of the interactions with climate change. As I mentioned earlier, however, the current El Nino is a little different to what we're used to seeing. That pattern of warm water in the ocean is not just in the, um, uh, off the coast of um, South America. We also have that small area off the coast of Australia. So we're still not one, because we've not seen that before, we're still not 100% sure how that might interact. It could bring a little more rain than we usually expect with El Nino, but it also might not. Um, on to, but once again, that's not something that we should be relying on to break um, what could be a really treacherous um, season ahead. So with that, I will leave my presentation there. Um, happy to take questions, but I don't know if that's something that we want to do later or now. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah, they're really, <laughs> I'd struggle to say the words, so then I forget to explain it. <laughs> 
So pyro they, they need a better name. Pyrocumulonimbus uh, nimbus fires are also known as PCB fires or firestorms. And basically it's when the smoke plume is so big and so high it interacts with the atmosphere. So when you think about a thunderstorm, because they are literally firestorms, there's lightning, there's thunder, there's even rain. And what can actually happen is these fire, they basically act like a thunderstorm, but with fire included. So, you know, you think about, you know, I hate to say it, but kind of like something that's dramatised in Hollywood. They're, they're, they're just like that. And the lightning that they can produce can actually start the fire, like kilometres, tens of kilometres in front of the original fire front. Sometimes the rain that they make can put out a bit of the fire or make the conditions slightly wetter ahead of that but the rain is usually so little and the fuel is usually so dry, it's not enough. So if you think about the really horrible photos that came out of um, Black Saturday in 2009 in Victoria, those huge plumes of smoke, they were PCBs or pyrocumulonimbus fires. As I mentioned, we saw 30 of them in Black Summer alone. Um, and that's, that wasn't just in terms of fires within or around the ACT, that was across the whole southeast of Australia. So they're the really dangerous ones. They're really the ones where the FFDR, forest fire danger rating, is at catastrophic code red, right? That's the ones that, you know, you cannot outrun. They do, they do the most damage and they're, you know, really the most frightening and for us climate scientists, the most concerning as well. Yep, up the back. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, on those those uh, particular clouds, yep. fires, cloud, fire clouds, um, yep. are they actually? Uh, does it does it start with the fire, or is it the other way around where the clouds start the? fire so to speak so it's the fire first and the, the conditions have to be so they generally need this is where it gets into atmospheric physics which is not my forte but the, the atmosphere has to be in a certain state for the fire to also be able to form into a firestorm but it starts with the fire actually burning and interacting with a relatively unstable atmosphere for it to also basically turn into a firestorm thank you that's all right there's another question down the front. Um, have we done any simulations of fires in Canberra? And if so, can we see them? That's a really good question. I have a colleague at UNSW Canberra, Jason Sharples, who's a fire modeler, and I'm not sure if he's done anything specific for the ACT or for Canberra. The problem is, we need really fine resolution models to be able to appropriately model fires. So what Jason does in his lab is test different fuels and then make inferences about how they may interact with atmospheric conditions. The next level up is to mimic those atmospheric conditions in our climate models and they don't necessarily work readily on the scales on which we need. There are projections of fire weather conditions um, for southeast Australia, um, and I'd be happy, that's, that's in academic literature, but I'd be happy to circulate them. But specifically for the ACT, I'm not sure if anything exists saying there'll be, a, you know, what a fire in Tugnarong might look like compared to Moncrief or Taylor or Gungalan, for example. Do you think we should be asking our governments to do that sort of modelling? I wouldn't. I, I would absolutely welcome a suggestion like that, yes. Um, it takes an, a huge investment and not just in people power as well. As, as I said, computational power is the real struggle. In saying that, with appropriate investment, that can be overcome. Any other questions? I feel like I have a scared a lot of people already. <laughs> not, not the great way to start an evening, but anyway. Um, are we already, there's a lot of fires happening already this season. Yeah. Um, with apps like, you know, fires near me, it feels like we've got more information about how many fires there are. Yeah. Um, has it started, does it, does it seem like it started as a, a worse season than what we're used to, um, or is our awareness more? And then also just thinking about the length in time for you know regrowth when you might see another bushfire in the same area, thinking about somewhere like Bermagui, which you know was affected in Black Summer, and then again recently with um, being close to houses. Yep. So I think so. For me, as a climate scientist, 
I'm actually a little bit surprised, and this is, then makes me more concerned about how quickly some of those fires have happened already this season. Honestly, if, you know, going back to the end of winter, I thought, well, no, this season probably won't be too bad. It will be primed for future seasons ahead. But to see what happened on the south coast and then what's happened up in Queensland and even in the northern rivers, remember they were flooded three years ago and now they're burning. You know, things have dried out so quickly because of the fact that La Nina's gone. El Nino has put its roots deeply in, as, as have the positive IOD. So that actually concerns me how quickly things have happened. Um, yes, we are more aware, and we're certainly heightened. Like, everyone remembers Black Summer for all the wrong reasons, and so we are certainly heightened, and I see that, and I respect that. But I also think that the risk is worse than what it otherwise would have been in a normal season, whatever normal is these days, yeah. Thanks very much for your clear and easy to understand explanation oh, <laughs> of our situation. I spent hours making sure or hoping that I didn't confuse people when I put those slides together, okay. so thank you. <laughs> well, you are a climate scientist too, aren't you? Yeah. What I was going to ask though is that um, despite the, the clarity and the believability of all of that, yep. we still have f factions in our community who yes. want to deny your messages and, and as a climate scientist, and you know, you, you would probably face even more difficult scenarios than what you've shared with us today. How do you respond to the challenge of communicating to people who really don't want to believe what you're saying or, or are just challenging you about it anyway? If I had five a dollar for every quest every time I was asked that question, I'd be a multimillionaire by now. And I don't have the, a, a great answer, I'm afraid. And I, I, I do, I, I've experienced this in my own family. Um, I've experienced this with every, you know, an everyday person on the street, even in forums like this. I'm not saying it will happen tonight, of course, but in public forums. I think this is, and for one reason, I was actually quite apprehensive to put figures and charts on tonight's presentation. We are well known for that, but I also didn't want to scare people off with figures and charts because I know it can be quite polarising. The best thing that I have tried, and it doesn't always work, but is to just have like a normal conversation. So throwing graphs and figures into people's face and statistics doesn't always work. Sometimes it does, but for a lot of the time if someone's already staunch in their opinion, it's just going to push them further in their corner. So a, a casual conversation seems to work a little better. Um, a, sorry, pardon the pun, but a slow burn conversation. So something that just doesn't happen, right? I'm going to convince you tonight that climate change is a thing and it's affecting us now. It's got to be something that's repeated often and repeated in a casual way. And that's, I've had some, some success in my own family with that sort of approach. But at the same time, we're all different, right? So what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for another. But I think, you know, especially, I, sometimes I feel that when I'm talking to a non-scientist and they don't know me, they, they think that I'm here to convince them and be an a, a overbearing power on them. So I think my job may be a little bit harder in that way when I'm trying to convince a, a sceptic, for want of a better term. But to you know, have a more general, general and friendly conversation, I think, is the better way to go in. Yeah. Well, that's, that matches my own learning as well, so okay. thanks for that. Because when people feel challenged, we get defensive. Absolutely. And even if it's rational argument, yep. our defensive system is to protect our beliefs. Yep. So, you know, for me, I think we need to be able to have safe conversations. And, yep. and I think that's what David's been trying to set up in yes. his work. Yep. And um, listen to the diverse points of views in a way where we actually learn to love the environment that we're in. It's, yep. it's an emotional conversation. Yep. where if we can care for this country that we're in and care for people, we will bring about uh, the sort of changes that we want to do. So it's not really more science, because we've got plenty of that. No, we've got, we, we've got we enough. We need to touch people's hearts. So for someone like me, you know, there's more data, more data, more science is always good. But I agree completely with communicating the message to the general audience that we don't need more data. We need better ways of trying to uh, jump over that hurdle. And I, yeah, certainly on a personal level, um, like... A, yeah, a personal conversation works best, definitely. Well, thanks for your efforts on that too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. It's really very interesting. And just the person said what changes we can do if we care about our country. So, as you said, you scared us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to, me. I swear. <laughs> no, but what the solutions can be done for that? 
Gosh, solutions. Yeah, another question I get asked of a lot. So we've, we've got, we're really in a position now, and this isn't just for fires, it's for a lot of things to do with climate change, heat waves, um, flooding, et cetera. We have to obviously reduce fossil fuel emissions. We all know that that conversation's going on, which we can do it better, but I won't get into that tonight. But we also really, we're at a point now where we really need to seriously start adapting properly. So whether that's, you know, we are doing a better job in terms of bushfire preparedness, thanks to previous events, but it's, all, it's got to go more than that. You know, where, where do we build our houses now? Where do we build our infrastructure? How do we manage fire and fire risk? Now, I know that's quite controversial, that some people are saying that we should do more hazard reduction burns, some people say that we should do less. We're also in a situation where the, that safe window is rapidly snapping shut. So it's not just about long-term changes, like fixing the problem, we're actually in a stage where we need to adapt. It's adaption and mitigation. Um, there's community efforts around that. You know, I, I really feel very strongly about investing more in not just volunteer fire services, but professional fire services as well. We need to do so much better at that. But also making sure that we are aware, much more aware in, in, in the community of what we can do to help prevent things getting out of control. We ultimately will always have fires here, we always have, but we're not managing them well enough in terms of the immediate risk and what we can do at a seasonal and you know, annual level as well. Uh, hi, mine's a comment more, more so than a question. Yep. Um, there is a saying that if you keep doing something the same way, you're likely to get the same result. Yep. And every time we have a, 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 a bushfire, um, all the resources are out there trying to put the fire out. As soon as the fire's gone and done, um, it's all forgotten. There is no... Uh, uh, all the work seems to be reactionary rather than proactive. Yes, and it's frustrating. Um, now, prior to the 2019 fires, there were 440 million hectares of native bush in Australia. 79% um, of those were eucalypts, 7% were wattles, and there were only 14% uh, other species. So we actually have a monoculture uh, of, of trees that burn like champions. Yep, yep. And we, uh, we need to look at our landscape differently and manage our landscape Agreed. differently. So when people say, isn't it wonderful after a bushfire, uh, the bush grows back again, that's not what you want because what's growing back is the next load of fuel. Well, that's, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, the fire-loving trees and shrubs. So we actually need to start thinking about managing the landscape by uh, creating greater biodiversity, uh, introducing a lot of, if necessary, exotic trees which are fire retardant, um, and, and start looking after, the, uh, looking after the soil. Yes. Because one of the factors in, in bushfires is, is that the, um, when you have a fire that goes through, the carbon in the soil is drawn okay, out, absolutely. goes into yep. the atmosphere, and the carbon in the soil is actually holding moisture. Yep. Um, so every fire that goes through drives the ground out even more, takes yep. the carbon out, and, and makes it less able to, to, to hold on to moisture. Uh, the, when eucalypts dry out, they drop their branches, they drop their, their, their twigs, that creates fuel for the next load. Exactly. So we actually... Now, obviously, we can't change the whole... Um, uh, of the um, native native uh, forests, but what we can do is start when a fire does go through, don't let it grow back the same way. Yes. Um, start introducing fire retardant trees into into um, very wide fire breaks. So if you do get a bushfire, it hits that it hits those fire breaks and it's then contained. Something else that we can learn from is indigenous practices of wildfire. They you know, it was low burns. No, no. Sorry, I disagree with that. Mm. Yeah, uh, we do have and one more speaker to get to, so this will be the, the final question. Okay. Um, we've all seen in the press about the difficulties with in getting insurance, uh, getting mm. it at all, or, or it being very expensive in relation to floods. Is a similar thing happening in relation to bushfire areas? Good question. Well... <sighs> If it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. So there's a lot of... I'm, like, I'm trying to think in the Canberra experience. I think a lot of us here can still, you know... We're not necessarily... Some of us are backing onto bush, but not all of us. And we can. it's not that much more to put a bushfire 
you know, levy on top of our insurance. There are other areas, however, in Australia where that's not the case. And on top of that, um, the socioeconomic profiles generally mean that people can't for afford insurance in, in the first place anyway. So certainly, yes, like the Northern Rivers, flood insurance is tens of thousands of dollars. The thing about floods are that they can happen year on year on year, and you can even get really extreme floods, multiple extreme floods in the course of a couple of months. And again, we saw that in the Northern Rivers. With bushfires, it's usually one very bad event, and you don't usually, I'll undermine, usually there, see a, an event of a similar intensity for another 10 or so years. So it, I'm not an actuary, but my you know, edu educated guess there would be the premium wouldn't be affected much, but there would certainly be places in Australia and in our cities where fire insurance would go up in the future. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, can we all give Sarah another round of applause? Thank, Thank you. you. And can you all now join me in welcoming the 2022 Senior Australian of the Year, Val Dempsey. Um, can you all hear me now? Hi. Um, I'm short. Can you see me? <laughs> I can't possibly imagine a more diverse community than our wonderful Canberra and all the challenges that we face constantly from season to season to season. And I can't possibly imagine what on earth I'm standing up here in front of you to talk about climate change and fires. I can only come along and chat about my own personal experience of being in Canberra in all the times that we've faced with serious climate change, fires, floods, drownings, deaths, and so it goes on. And I guess as a woman in her 73rd year as of next week, <laughs> I keep asking the question, how come we're going through this all over again? But I'd like to thank David Pocock, particularly, and his team. And David, I'm so sorry that you're not well enough tonight to come along. It would have been so nice to have you here. But I should very much like to thank them for the invite to come along and just have a chat. Um, I'm no scientist, I have to tell you that. My background is nursing and I trained at the Waden Valley Hospital with another lung lovely, lovely young lady who's here with us tonight. Hello, Carmel. <laughs> and, do you know, just growing up here in Canberra, you have a memory of how the climate changes. I remember snow in 19... Well, maybe 1957, 58, being on the ground on Christmas Day. Now, can you believe that? That is absolutely, honestly true. And we get late frost. Hello, no more bloody tomato plants. I'll put them in and then the frost comes. So we get changes. But I also remember my brothers going up the backyard and nicking a couple of eggs, going out the front yard and cracking them onto the concrete footpath and frying an egg on the hot concrete footpath. I also remember going and walking across from our home in Narrabunda, up across Frome Street, no shoes, mum would not give us a towel, we all lost the towels, no shoes, you could just wear your togs, off you go, down to the Manica Baths. And as you crossed Canberra Avenue, you ended up with hot tar on your feet because your brothers wouldn't give you a lift across the road, I can tell you that. It was hot, hot, hot. But then there were times also too where the climate changed and you didn't get tomatoes at Christmas time anymore. The fruit on the trees didn't ripen in time. The rhubarb did not come in early. 
Now, this might be very boring and uninteresting for people who might think that perhaps climate change doesn't affect you. But I pay the bills in the house and I go shopping. And my shopping list is changing because climate change is affecting our rural communities where they grow the food for us, where they look after the animals that are going to feed us. Where the flooding was in Lismore, I had the privilege as a St John Ambulance volunteer to go to Lismore on two, two occasions and to see how devastating Mother Nature can be and wipe out communities, wipe out people, their lives, their businesses. 35 feet of water went through there and you were right to mention that it then provides fodder and fuel for the next fires because it bounces back. But the thing that doesn't bounce back and the thing that we face all the time is that I heard Sarah saying we do need to adapt, that we need to take on challenges and we need to face problems. And if you're not a part of the solution, then the problems keep persisting like you were saying here. So I look at what happened in Lismore and how very vastly different that was entirely for me when I stood in 2003 in Rivet, in my home, with my awfully English neighbours across the road, not understanding why we're screaming at them to wet the towels and put them at the windows, close the windows and get inside. We just put four trailer loads worth of dry mulch in the yard. Who else did all of that? Who was preparing for a dry season and didn't want to be dried out? So we put the mulch down and we put up the shade cloth, you know, that plasticky stuff that you put up that catches fire when there is a huge thunderstorm coming through with fire, a hundred foot tall wall of flame bearing down from those pine trees. We saw it coming, 10 days of it. But were we ready? No. Have we learned the lesson? I wonder. So here we are in Rivette. My brother raced down to his local church where he's the caretaker pastor. And he just looked around, pulled out the fire hoses, threw his hands up in the air and said, I've got to get back to my sister. She needs me. By the time he got back, his church was gone. The only thing standing for him was, funnily enough, when we went back that afternoon, was a plastic playground. Can you believe that? The plastic playground stayed. But houses were gone. People's lives were gone. And the neighbours across the road were still wondering what the hell happened. And my daughter's trying to ring me on the phone from Canberra because... The fence in the backyard was burning and they were on the roof trying to get water out of the swimming pool because they were up high and the pumps weren't working and the water wasn't coming up high, up into the higher houses up the street. So they were trying to save the house with f water out of the swimming pool, screaming at me, Mum, get the, get the fire engines, please. The experience of hearing that within your own family. My grandchildren were in that house. She grabbed the child. The husband's on the roof. She grabbed her daughter who kept screaming, not without the guinea pig. And she said, I've got to, I've got to save the paperwork. She raced upstairs and in the dark, because if you remember, it was dark and it was horrid and the smoke and the smell, racing upstairs and grabbed that precious drawer where everything so important is in it, tipped out the pillow, emptied the stuff into the pillowcase, grabbed the kid, raced downstairs, threw everything in the car, and the husband said from the roof, stop, 
the fire's gone past us, don't move. It was as quick as that. We couldn't tell whether or not we still had kids and grandkids over there. Were we prepared? No. Did we learn a lesson? Well, let's wait and see. I hope we don't have to see. But there's, I rang the radio station later that night and I said, you know, we're all in agony. We are so shocked. But I just want to tell you about the drawer that my daughter saved. In the heat of the moment, she grabbed it, the kid, the guinea pig, and lo and behold, she happened to save the drawer full of socks. <laughs> so there's no doubt that they don't have to worry about socks anymore in that fire. But you know, it becomes personal. When a fire comes along, the things that go through your mind, it doesn't always resonate with save yourself. It resonates with the people around you, your loved ones. You look at the house and you think, oh, what the hell, it can go. Um, what are you going to grab? I rang my kids in Caboolture this morning because fire is around them. And I said, are you prepared? And they said, oh, Mum, I've got 4,000 litres and a tank and a pump ready to roll. I said, good. He has a severely autistic son who's 28 years old. I said, where's Alex? Oh, he's at home. He's going to manage to turn the pump on with no other neighbours around. You wonder how really you think things through. But, you know, from more of a personal aspect, I can now step into another role and that's the role of the volunteer. When fire comes through and families are devastated, communities are lost, animals are burned, cinders, you can smell them. I was asked on that dreadful day, I was down at the National Gallery with my daughter Michelle and her lady, and we're having lunch, and she said, Ma'am, it's public holiday. Why have you got the emergency phone? What, what are you doing with the St John phone? I said, Oh, don't worry, darling, it never rings. It rang for 28 straight days. And I was asked immediately when it rang, could I pack up and go immediately to the office and be prepared to get 40 people to go down and support the fires down in Bega, down the coast, down to Marimula, and send them into the, the literally into the unknown. My f brother was down at Cabago in a, he owned a petrol station, owned a petrol station. So I said to my daughter, get home, go and sort the family out. I need to look after my other family. Because you know, volunteering means that you give up one apron, which is your home apron, and you step into your other one. And that's your other family. And the kids that I asked to scramble arrived within one hour of me calling them. And they were ready to go and do what they needed to do. And I've been doing this for a long time. I don't always get it right, but this was a big challenge for me. And they're like my kids. And I said to them, would you mind driving into the fire, please? And they said, sure, Auntie Val, we'll do it. Can you possibly imagine that request and how they responded to that? So, you know, fires coming from these enormous changes that we're experiencing, floods that we experience, the changing dynamics of how we live within our community. It really asks each and every one of us to step up and be that better person and perhaps dig deeper than you ever thought that you had inside you. So I was sent a text and a picture 
from the first group of people who set out towards Kuma. And from the front of the car, the dashboard photograph of a car full of five, like I say, like my kids, five very brave souls who an hour ago did not know that they would be doing this. And the picture was driving toward Kuma. And going to them, they were heading into fog. But the car coming towards them had a set of lights on and you could only really see them like a stargaze. But it wasn't fog, it was fire and smoke. And you couldn't see more than 50 feet in front of you. And behind that, there was hot, blazing, black with embers. And those carload of volunteers drove straight into that down to Kuma. You never know just what you've got inside of you when you've asked about being able to step up and do something. So they went away for 24 hours and they stayed for seven days. I couldn't contact them. Guess what? <laughs> no phones, no food. I didn't give them any money. They went away with one change of clothes. They went to buy a pillow because they were sleeping on the ground. But they couldn't buy a pillow because they had no caching thing. There were no ATMs and the stores were shut because the people's homes were all burning and people weren't there. Marvellous people stepped up and stepped forward and the clothes they had on their back were rinsed out and offered to my kids, the volunteers. And what did I learn? I was asked on, <laughs> I've just been to the Australia Day Awards here in the ACT, some marvellous, marvellous people who have been nominated and have been awarded the ACT Australian of the Year Awards. And when I was, <laughs> don't know, still, you know, the uh, <laughs> pinch me moment, when I was on that stage two years ago and they said, Val, what did you learn about that? And I said, well, apart from learning so much about myself, I learned just so much about other people, the generosity of communities. When they have nothing, they gave you what left they had. When they had no food, they fed other people. When there was no more bandages, they scrounged them and the hospital stepped forward. When they had to go door to door knocking on doors and they'd never done that in their life because they, they're a bit shy like I am, I suppose. But you don't know what's inside you until you're asked to do this. And they said, but Val, what else did you learn on that day? Said young Dan, Dan Butcher, who was nominated for Australian of the Year this year. What a wonderful nomination. And he said, what else did you learn, Val? I said, cotton undies, love, because when you go for, seven, for 24 hours and you have to stay for seven days, you really should have cotton undies. But I, in making light of all of that, I look back now and I say to myself, well, what did I really learn about all of that? The first thing is community resilience. The second thing is that people need to stand up Step up, take action, be ready, be prepared. How many of you have done your yards over? How many of you have checked your gutters? How many of you keep that lawn mowed where you think the park across the street is not being mowed by the guess who? Duh, somebody's got to mow it. Why can't it be you as a community to make sure that those areas that are really looking very dangerous do something about it? Be the solution to the problem and not the problem itself. So are we ready? Ask yourself what it is that you can do to help your neighbours, yourself, your family, and get a bit political. Find out why things aren't being done. Where's the action plan? I ask that tonight. Where's our action plan? Just thought I'd mention.
my action plan is, I think I'll just stand back and watch everybody run amok again. I saw it before, what's changed? Wake up, stand up, look around you, take action, be prepared. Think about the things that you can do personally for your own safety, for your families, for your neighbours, for your community. I might as well say it, learn first aid. You never know when you're going to use it. You don't know when you're going to need it. Get that bag in your house ready that's got all the papers. Get those things ready that you know that you're going to need. Get your medications in a ready area. Make sure your script's in one place. Make sure you've got a change of clothes in a bag, an extra toothbrush and toothpaste. Because I can tell you, when you arrive at my evacuation centre, you won't have any of that. But I'd like to see you be prepared to do that. Because throughout that whole time, when Canberra was experiencing that, I did go to the evacuation centres as a volunteer and I did see people arrive without any of that preparation because we think it's not going to happen to us. But sadly, we're in a position where it might. Do you know, for the last 18 months, I've had an absolutely amazing experience and there's no doubt that this experience has asked me to look inside myself, dig a bit deeper, be a little bit more open, a little bit more sharing, learn to talk about yourself, Val. I don't, never did that very easily, to be honest. But also look at the diversity and the wonderfulness of each and every other person that you come across and that you meet. And never ever, Val, never ever presume that they aren't wonderful because they absolutely are, every single one of you. So because you are so wonderful, you can stand up, you can step up, you can be ready. I don't think I was really ready for this last 18 months. But what I can say, I was delighted to have that opportunity to be out and about, just as I am delighted to be here with you tonight. Thank you.